Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Harvard Law School and the Berkman Klein Center uh, lunch talk, um, a longstanding uh, tradition, really an institution at, uh, at BKC. Um, a couple of things I want to say. First of all, I'm Matthew Battles. Uh, I'm associate director of Meta Lab at Harvard, uh, which is a project of the Berkman Klein Center. Uh, uh, and you'll hear a little bit more about Meta Lab uh, because Yanni was my colleague there for a couple of years, um, a few years ago. Uh, uh, housekeeping matters. Uh, First of all, the event is uh, webcast and, and it's recorded. So you'll want to bear in mind your own uh, telegenic personality uh, when you contribute to the conversation. Uh, and if you want to contribute using Twitter, you're welcome to point tweets at the center at BKC Harvard. Uh, so, uh, so that's the housekeeping. Uh, and just to give a little bit of a sense of run of show, uh, Yanni will be talking uh, for 20, 30 minutes. Um, I'm going to take. Uh, the, the microphone privilege to ask him the first couple of questions. We'll have a little bit of a conversation, and then we'll open up. We'll open it up to the room. Um, so with that, I want to welcome uh, back uh, to the Berkman Center, uh, as it was when he was here, Yanni Lukisis. Um, Yanni is on the faculty of the School of Literature, uh, Media, and Communication. I think I got the order of those right. Uh, at Georgia so Tech. Important. <laughs> Uh, uh, and uh, he runs there um, a, a group called the Local Data Design Lab. Um, and Yanni's going to be talking to us about um, a book that um, I've been excited about uh, as I've been aware of its germination over the last few years, uh, his, his new book, All Data Are Local. Um, I've been excited about it in part because um, a, a couple of the cases that Yanni um, approaches in the book uh, he began to develop um, this research when he was with me at, at Metal Lab. And I say with me because for the first couple of years we were together, it was really Yanni and myself <laughs> in an empty room trying to figure out what a Metal Lab would be. Um, uh, it emerged out of our kind of blended um, uh, practices of attention and, and, and focuses of interest um, to blend uh, design and art practice uh, with a really critical attention to the way um, data, the way uh, digitality, uh, the way technologies uh, and, and platforms are, are lived um, in, in situated contexts, um, in, in, our, in our neighborhoods, in our cities, uh, in, our, in our institutions, in our families as well. Um, as well as uh, how they penetrate, uh, as you'll hear from Yanni um, when he talks about the Arnold Arboretum, the natural world as well, and, and the city uh, and urban structures uh, and, and uh, cosmopolitan contexts. Um, that interest, I think, in the city probably began for Yanni with his training as an architect at Cornell. Uh, Yanni went on to uh, study design and computation and do his doctoral work uh, in that program at, at MIT. Uh, following uh, on that, um, spent time in, in postdoctoral study with Sherry Turkle and David Mendel um, uh, in, in STS uh, scholarship, uh, always grounded in a, a kind of lively uh, improvisatory mix of design practice, uh, uh, technology making, uh, engagement with communities, and, and scholarship. Um, and so I'm really thrilled. Um, uh, to have the chance to share with Yanni the, the, the new book, All Data Are Local. I think it's a, it's a study, but it's also a, a, a kind of field guide to data in the wild, um, and a provocation as well um, for us to think about uh, data in contexts beyond um, mere openness, um, to think about the conversational, uh, the human uh, dimensions of, of this thing we call data. Um, and so with that, I want to turn it over to Yanni Lukisis. Thank you. Can everybody hear me yes. in the back? Well, thanks for all being here. And thanks for that incredibly generous introduction. Um, it is, it's really a pleasure to be back. I spent two wonderful years here uh, at Metal Lab and the Berkman Center. And the book really got its start there. And, and uh, being back here to talk about and share it with you all uh, is, is tremendously exciting. And I look forward to having a, a discussion with you all. I'm going to give about 25 or 30 minutes of remarks, um, give some examples to kind of ground us. For those of you who maybe haven't taken a look at the book, which I'm sure is most of you, um, uh, and, then, and then we'll get to some discussion. So I like to think of my work as bridging or bringing together two areas of study. Uh, on one hand, 
the work of data visualization, which means how do we graphically present evidence about the world we live in? And data studies, which tries to look for the, actually the limits, um, the assumptions, the implicit values, and often the absences in those data, and, and, and kind of contend with them. And so when we bring those two together, I think there's uh, all kinds of potential to rethink how we do visualization um, to make it uh, uh, more effective and more just. My focus is really on public data, so data that's kind of out there and accessible in the world. But I think we could be, uh, it's not enough for data to just be open. And, and I'll explain um, in, in the following examples what I mean by that. Uh, I'm really interested in, in how we can look at public data in new ways. Uh, this is a book that, whoops, jumping ahead a little. Uh, this is a book that I began writing. So when I was at Metalab, um, between 2012 and 2014. Uh, now looking back on that era, particularly in terms of data, it seems like another time, you know. Uh, data, big data, specifically we're on the verge of transforming how we do science, how we do government, how we do design. Uh, and, and a lot has changed and that perspective seems a bit, a bit quaint now, right? Um, a lot has changed for me personally as well, you know. I, uh, I, I, I left Metalab, I moved to Georgia, uh, I had two kids. Uh, I'd, I'd like to say that probably shaped the book as much as anything else. Uh, but societally, data and algorithms have kind of taken center stage, right? And I'm sure you've all seen headlines like this. These are actually from quite a while ago, um, but they just kind of keep coming. Uh, we, I think societally, we've, we've embraced the fact that Data uh, contain biases, unanticipated impacts. Uh, even there's even blatant misuse around data, right? Uh, and and data can be racist, data can be sexist, uh, or it can be simply fake, right? And the examples run the kind of gamut from p hacking to election hacking. But I don't think we're ready to give up on data as a way of knowing about the world. So my inquiry is really about what does it mean to work with data, knowing that data have all kinds of limitations uh, in ways that are both uh, uh, ethical and, and, and effective and, and, uh, and just, actually. So the, the way that I see forward for this kind of work really actually builds on a long tradition of scholarship. And, and uh, Matthew started to kind of take us into that uh, but there's been work in, in, in STS, in um, uh, uh, science and technology studies, in, um, in feminist and post-colonial critiques of the way science gets done and the notion of objectivity. People like Sandra Harding, Donna Haraway, maybe more recently Anita Chan have helped to show us that data are situated uh, like any other way of knowing. Uh, I think one difference I take to a lot of that work is often when we talk about situated, we think about being embodied and who's making data, who's using data. Uh, but I'm also interested in where we're using data. And I think place uh, is, a, is, a, is a crucial piece of what we're missing when we talk about and, 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 and think about what data are and what they're doing and how, they, how they're used in the world. And I'm very interested in how data get made differently in different places and why they may matter. So here is the cover of the book. Uh, and, I, and I think the title pretty much sums up my argument here. Um, all data are local. Now what I mean by that is nothing more than that data are made by people, often with their dutiful machines, in a time, in a place, using the tools at hand, within existing organizations, um, and, and crucially, often for audiences that are conditioned or disciplined to receive them, right? So data are not just facts, they are cultural artifacts, right? Uh, and when I say, when I use the word local, um, I mean that in the relative sense, right? So local can be local to a neighborhood, it can be local to a network, it can be local to a city, um, to a region, to a country. Um, local can be um, um, 
local to the earth. If we're, so local is just uh, a way of suggesting that there's actually something beyond that domain. And I think with each data set, um, we have to kind of redraw that boundary and figure out um, what are the conditions and the context in which we have to understand that data and what they're doing. And so in a way, local is defined by difference. It's difference from other localities, right? So let's talk about an example. Uh, I like to use this example. This is actually something that uh, I, I, I uh, kind of encountered early on in my work um, with MetaLab. We were doing a lot of work with the uh, Digital Public Library of America, which how many people are familiar with this project? Probably a lot of people here. Well, maybe not as many as I thought, but you know, it's a, it, it was a Berkman project at one point. This is a project to bring together uh, the digitized collections from libraries, museums, and archives across the country and create one point from which you can access all these collections. And one of their biggest collections was uh, from the New York Public Library. Um, here's an image you know, of its facade along Fifth Avenue. Now, this is a, uh, this is a place, you know, it's, it's a destination. It's one of the biggest research libraries in the country, if um, not the world. It's, uh, you know, a lot of people like to hang out on it, the steps here on Fifth Avenue. Uh, and I was, I was doing a project after I actually left Metal Lab. I was at Georgia Tech and I was still kind of grappling with this collection. And what's interesting about the DPLA is it kind of brings together data sets that were created in different places, brings them together into one place, and allows you to have this kind of comparative view of those data. And uh, we were digging into the collections of the New York Public Library, which has, uh, you know, books, but also um, newspapers, maps, photos. I think they even have Winnie the Pooh um, in their collection, and they have data that describe these objects. And we came to this question. Uh, we were very interested in, we, we started to discover through this collection that it's not just that data get made differently in different places, but even in a single institution and a wealthy institution like the New York Public Library, um, you have this incredible heterogeneity in data. Um, and we tried to simplify that into one question. Now, this is what, you know, when you look at this, you might think of a date, right? Um, and depending on where you're from, it might be the month, day, year, or um, day, month, year. And we wrote a little algorithm to try to figure out how many different ways are there of writing the date in a collection like the New York Public Libraries. And this is their online collections that we're examining. But does anybody want to hazard a guess? How many different ways are there of writing the date that an institution like this has in use? 20, it's a good guess. Because it's going beyond English, it's a lot more. I think that's a good indication of, of, of kind of what's to come. <laughs> Anyone else? 100. 100. OK, so we found 1,719 date formats. And that just has to do with how we wrote the algorithm. If we wrote the algorithm differently, we might have gotten different. Um, a different number. But here's, I'm going to start to zoom in to give you a sense of some of these. And the number in red is the number of times that format is used. Uh, and this is a, this is a collection of uh, 800,000 objects. And it's actually just a small subset of the, the larger uh, undigitized collections of the New York Public Library, which are about 50 million objects. Uh, so there are a lot of objects here. But there's a lot more different than we would expect. And when you look at this stuff, um, you know, sometimes there are Roman numerals, there are other languages, sometimes the name of the printer is put in there. There's a lot of approximation. Um, so there's the sense that, you know, for each of these objects, we might have, you know, different degrees of knowledge about, you know, when they were made. Um, and, and they're very human, right? Uh, you can imagine people creating these um, with kind of limited knowledge and, and time and, and so forth. And, you know, usually when we encounter, so in the work of data visualization, often you get these heterogeneous data sets. And this kind of standard procedure is that we've got to 
we've got to clean the data, which means essentially normalizing it, trying to find the, the kind of common elements, right, and then getting rid of everything else. And cleaning, this term cleaning suggests that all that other stuff is just dirt um, and, and needs to be gotten rid of. And the way that I would like to reframe this problem, I think comes from an anthropologist uh, named Mary Douglas. She wrote a book called Purity and Danger, in which she asserts that, you know, dirt is not an objective category. Uh, it's relative. So, you know, all of you are eating lunch and maybe there's some sauce on your sandwich or something like that. That's not dirt, right? But if you were to spill it on your shirt, then it becomes dirt. Um, and, and Douglas says that dirt is nothing more than matter out of place. And I'd contend that what we often think of as data dirt is really data out of place. Um, data from another context that we don't necessarily understand. So in order to make sense of those data, we have to dig into those contexts and try to understand data as part of a larger system of knowledge that it's part. Data don't stand alone, right? So often we think when, when we use this term data set, we're talking about something that is portable, um, it's complete, it's closed, but none of those things are really true about data. And I prefer the term data setting. I think, I think it kind of draws our attention to places like the New York Public Library and its associated histories and collections that it's drawn from that can help us um, get closer to and start to understand what these data mean within a larger um, uh, system of knowledge. Uh, I'm going to talk about a couple more things um, just to kind of ground this example or show the implications of this example. First, I want to talk a little bit about what do I mean by data? Uh, I get that question a lot. And I want to talk about the stakes of the book uh, in terms of what Anita Chan has called digital universalism, because I really see this book as uh, trying to challenge the idea of digital universalism. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about the principles of the book. The book is organized by six principles of local data. And then I'm going to end with a kind of an evocative example that's from more recent work and tries to propose, if we take up these principles, what might it look like to work with to explore data sets in, in, a, in, a, in a local way. OK. So. Christine Borgman and, and Michael Buckland have this great way of talking about data. They say, similar to the idea of dirt, data is also a rhetorical category. And if you start to look at varied data sets, you'll notice that they kind of don't share a lot of essential qualities. And they, they assert that actually asking what are data is the wrong question. You should ask when are data, because anything can become data if it's taken up as part of a claim. And in um, Borgman's book, Big Data, Little Data, No Data, uh, she writes that, imagine you find a box of photographs in your parents' attic. That's not inherently data, right? But if you started to make claims about it based on those photographs, maybe about your family structure, maybe about um, the clothing trends of the day, maybe about the mechanics that the cameras used to make those photographs, suddenly they become data. And I'm sure we could think of similar examples um, from elsewhere. And I think this is a very evocative notion, but I think it misses something, and something captured by another theorist of science and technology, Bruno Latour, um, who has this kind of cute phrase to talk about data, um, or what he calls inscriptions. He says, they're immutable mobiles. And that means just what it sounds like. They are things, or representations, um, that we expect to move anywhere, and they don't change when we move them. Uh, and I think you could kind of relate to that. Um, when you download something from the internet, you don't expect it to change on its way to your computer. But uh, the truth is that data don't actually move easily. Or when they do move, they're difficult to interpret. Um, and there is a, a kind of friction that we need to become um, more aware of. So I like to think of data as allegedly mobile evidence. <laughs> it's evidence that we think should move uh, without changing, 
um, and we expect to, but there are all kinds of problems we run into, and, and my work is really to try to kind of address and contend with those, with those issues. Uh, I want to say something quickly about my methodology or my approach to this work. I am not an anthropologist. I'm not a, uh, I don't think of myself as an ethnographer in the traditional sense, but I like to take on what Sherry Ortner calls an ethnographic stance. And that really means that I'm using, it's, it, the ethnographic stance is an attempt to use the self as the instrument of inquiry. So the book is really about my kind of journey through various data settings and attempts to understand them through a combination of um, uh, just reading the data, um, making visualizations of them, interviewing people involved in creating those data, um, observing them at work, um, so through a variety of uh, what I think of as kind of uh, participant um, uh, observation techniques. Um, and I, I sincerely believe that we don't all need to become ethnographers to have this kind of more culturally grounded understanding of data. It, it, but it requires curiosity and an openness to connecting with people around, around data. Okay. So let me say something about the stakes here. Um, I mentioned this term digital universalism. Now, the idea of digital universalism, as Chan outlines it, is that um, it's an expectation by digital systems that we're all just users. And it doesn't matter where we are or who we are, um, that we're all the same in the face of these interfaces. And um, in her book, Networking Periphery, she really challenges that. Um, but what I see here is a kind of underlying, what I call place agnosticism in digital systems. Um, and this can be found in the work of a lot of theorists, um, going back to Marshall McLuhan, who talked about uh, electronic media collapsing space and time, to people like Nic Nicholas Negroponte, who famously wrote, uh, being digital means less and less dependence upon being in a specific place at a specific time. He suggested that place itself was going to be transferable. And I think these are inherently problematic statements um, that we, we need to challenge. I'm going to read you actually a little from the book to give you a bit of a sense of the, the tone of the book and uh, explain what I think of as the stakes. So, I write, the diversity and prosperity of the world's varied and contingent digital practices depend on our acceptance of data's locality. In fact, the stakes for the future of the internet could not be higher. If left unchallenged, digital universalism could become a new kind of colonialism in which practitioners at the periphery are made to conform to the expectations of a dominant technological culture. Learning to look at the local conditions of data can be a form of resistance to the ideology of digital universalism and the threat of erasure that it poses to myriad data cultures. Okay. So, having said that, I, I think we also need to be really careful that we are not romanticizing the local, right? Um, and I want to tell you another quick story that actually came out of a workshop that Matthew and I ran together um, called Beautiful Data, um, together with Meta Lab. We actually hosted it a couple of times. And one of the participants, uh, uh, Maria McWhirter, wa was a, um, a historian and a curator at the Smithsonian. And she told this incredible, um, Maria's an African-American woman, um, and she told a story about, during her time at the Smithsonian, doing a search of the collections for the word black. And what was returned, whoops, was a number, and I, I worked with her to try to recreate this search a little, uh, a number of artifacts in the collection that were labeled as made by black artists or um, coming from black culture or in some ways being associated with blackness as an identity, right? And then she searched for white and whiteness. And she came up with stuff like this. Plants that had white flowers, maybe the name white attributed to an artist, um, nothing to do with racial identity. And what she took away from this was, which I, I thought was incredibly powerful was, that in its absence, whiteness is represented here as the default. Um, 
And I think this goes beyond when we talk about bias in data. This is really data being shaped by invisible values, assumptions, a kind of ideology of white supremacy, in fact, um, that, that um, McCorder is calling attention to. Um, and and this, this kind of ideology, these kinds of absences are only visible through comparative analysis. And I think, you know, when I talk about locality, that's what I mean. It allows you to kind of access these, um, this kind of comparative perspective on data. Um, Clifford Geertz, who wrote a lot about local knowledge, like to say that we can't understand the local in relationship to some imagined universal, but really in relation, only in relationship to some other locality. Um, okay, so these are the six principles. I'm not gonna go into them in depth. I hope you know, they will pique your curiosity, and these examples will kind of invite you to check out the book. Um, I'll just mention briefly, so of course, the first principle I've already talked about. Um, the second principle, data have complex attachments to place, um, came out of work that I started with Matthew at the Arnold Arboretum. The Arnold Arboretum is part of Harvard University, um, out in Jamaica Plain, incredible place I, 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 I highly recommend visiting. It's a place where you can really understand um, data's relationship to, to, to this idea of place, how places shape data in certain ways, how data shape those places in turn. Um, and, and so the, the book is really trying to come to terms with what do data look like from a particular place and what are those um, sometimes unexpected relationships that we might find. Um, and that's, that's kind of grounded in um, um, data on plants, uh, trees, vines, and shrubs there that they've um, collected for uh, over 140 years. And they have like kind of an extensive data set. Um, the next principle, data are collected from heterogeneous sources, turns to this case of the Digital Public Library of America and asks, what happens when you bring data from different places together in one place? And what does that reveal? And what kinds of um, place attachments are retained in the process? Uh, and how can you discover those through visualizations that highlight the classifications, the schemata, the constraints? the errors, even the absences, and the rituals that might go into producing those data, because those data very much hold all of those um, elements of their formation. Um, uh, I have a chapter on um, how data and algorithms are entangled. These days, a lot of the focus is on algorithms, but algorithms aren't really, can't be disentangled from data so easily. Uh, data are made to be recognized by certain algorithms, and algorithms are made to, with the expectation that they're going to um, um, interact with certain kinds of data. So there's a, there's a kind of deeply historical relationship there. And I examine, I do an examination of natural language processing algorithms, which I'm sure we've all heard about, um, and how they're grounded in historical texts that have a lot of assumptions about what we mean by natural when we talk about natural language. Uh, and then uh, the chapter five is, about interfaces and how interfaces actually first decontextualize data, kind of um, uh, um, take data out of, out of the context in which they're made, and then create new contexts, new settings in which the data are meant to be fully understood. And I use the example of Zillow, which is a online housing marketplace, maybe some of you, some of you are familiar with, um, to show how interfaces do this work of contextualization. So context is not just about where the data were made is also about uh, where, they're, where they're used and how that usage is kind of shaped and, 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 and set. Um, and then the summative principle has to do with recognizing that data are really no more than indexes to local knowledge. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if you were to look at the index of my book alone, it's kind of like a data set, um, and it has you could probably learn a lot about what's in the book, right? But it's infinitely more useful <laughs> in combination with the book itself. And that's kind of what I'm asking people to do, to look at data as really a starting point for further inquiry and, uh, and understanding. And look, what are the deeper sources that data can point us to? The sense that data never tell the whole story, okay. Um, I also go into a variety of principles. I kind of, you know, this is a book that's meant, 
for people who are interested in understanding data in more depth, but also for, uh, for designers, people who want to make new, new systems around data. And I'm not going to... I'm not going to talk about these explicitly, but rather I'm going to show you one final example that I think tries to bring together and enact a number of these principles um, called the Map Room Project. So the Map Room is a collaboration with Jer Thorpe, a uh, digital artist, and together we've been trying to build a network of local spaces for map making and data exploration that allow people to um, explore data in relationship to their own lived experience um, by trying to make maps of the places they live that kind of combine different sources of knowledge together, right? Uh, it's a project that doesn't assume that data speak for themselves, but rather that um, data are understood in the context of, of other kinds of knowledge, right? And we want to understand what, what context means in different places and, and different situations. And these are spaces really for um, collaborative data exploration, so they're inherently social spaces and, and, and creative exploration. So we, we want to actively engage people kind of in interpreting and um, uh, thinking about what any, and, and sometimes challenging um, what data seem to be saying about the places they live. Here's an image of, uh, this is a project that we've used with students, with different kinds of um, uh, um, neighborhood groups, with planners. Um, um, we're talking about um, doing, doing some map rooms in libraries. Here you can see some students. Um, using the map room, it's, it's quite a simple technology. There's an overhead projector which guides students um, in drawing maps by hand. And the projection is <coughs> the students or participants uh, select a, uh, an area that they want to map. And, uh, and then they, and, and the encouragement is that people are actually mapping places where they live or that they know in an intimate way. Um, and, and, um, and then as they draw their kind of paths and kind of where they live and issues that they're concerned about, then they can turn on different data layers and see their, um, their experiences uh, in relationship to data sets. And these, those might be data from census. They might be city-made data. Um, uh, we've, we've experimented with a lot of different things. This is a kind of deeply inherently accessible system. It's not one that you really need to be trained on. Um, and as I said, we've worked with a variety of, of audiences over here on the left. Um, this is uh, Dr. McLean, who's an environmental justice activist in Savannah, who we're working with uh, on issues of um, coastal flooding and air pollution in, in neighborhoods in Savannah. And, um, and then on the right, you can see a uh, a young kid at a, um, a, a pop-up version we did in the Atlanta planning office. And so, you know, people show up to these events and, and they draw, and they draw and they talk, and they reflect on what data, how data seem to be representing uh, places they know well, and, um, and they create these, these shared representations. Um, so one version of the map room is in my lab at Georgia Tech. It's for making pretty big maps. These are, so these are paper maps. Um, this one's 16 feet long. Um, and I won't go into kind of detail in the apparatus how it works, but there's an overhead projector. It's on a rail that moves. Um, you can see these are hand-drawn maps. Um, you can, because it's paper, you can also incorporate all kinds of media, photographs, other kinds of images. Here's a technical diagram of how this version works. Um, and we hope that this is a, a new kind of uh, technology that help, helps people to examine data in new ways and, um, and, and challenge those data when thinking about what, what those data might be leaving out uh, uh, and they know about, about the places they live. We have a more mobile version that we've used extensively. Um, this was in New Orleans. Here's the kind of maps that people make. Um, you can see that, um, you know, 
people are leaving the traces of their, of their hands. Everybody has their own way of drawing. You kind of can't make a mistake. And then we can overlay different kinds of data layers. Here we were doing a lot of ex experimenting with data on gentrification, um, changes in um, median income, and in, in, um, percentage of college educated residents, um, and, and, and race and percentage of white occupancy in different neighborhoods around New Orleans. Um, here you have, this is a class of high school students in Savannah working with a climate scientist, Kim Cobb, on um, making a map of their neighborhood. So I'm gonna kind of leave it there. Whoops. Uh, I think, you know, the takeaway really is you know, thinking locally can be a, a way of thinking critically about data. And we want to explore, continue to explore through vehicles like the map room, kind of what does that mean? And what do these local contexts, um, how do they kind of shape uh, the production and use of data in different ways? Uh, I've had a lot of students collaborate with me on, on these projects, on the book and on, um, on the map room, and I just want to acknowledge them. And I want to leave you with, with one thought. Um, so while I was writing this book, I would think a lot about who's going to read this. And my, often my students would come to mind as the first audience. But as I said, I also had a couple of kids while I was writing this book. And it kind of weighed on me, you know, if my kids read this book someday, what do I want them to take away from it? And I think it's this. Uh, and, and, and it's a message that I think should appeal to a broader audience. Uh, as you seek to explore the world, data can be a wonderful starting point. They can be a bridge to get closer to the people and places beyond data. But let's not take the availability of data, the easy access to data, as permission to remain at a distance from those people and those places. Thank you. Thanks, Yanni. Well, um, and can you hear me? Yes, I can hear myself. Yeah. So as I threatened, I'm going to take um, the opportunity to ask Yanni a few questions um, and 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 pick up a few points that um, I'm intrigued by uh, and that um, have been part of our ongoing discussion for years. And then, uh, and then we want to open the floor. And I'll, I'll share my microphone down here. And we have another microphone uh, that we'll be able to pass around uh, up, up, up in the back. And, and, uh, and so we'll, we'll try to get coverage and, and get all voices engaged. Um, thank you, Yanni. It's really, uh, again, thrilling to see the book is out and beginning to, uh, to build its, its, uh, its audience and, and connect and, and, and find its uses. Um, I wanted to um, think about with you a little bit uh, that ethnographic stance mm. that you instance uh, at the top of the discussion, and 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 in particular, the reflexiveness of the project that you um, that you referred mm. to that um, that you know you're thinking of this uh, question of the locality of data was shaped not only. Um, by encounters with with collections data mm -hmm. um, in the context of some of the metal lab projects you described, but also as you um, made a life transition, uh, had, had children, <laughs> moved to Atlanta. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, when you have talked about um, the work, uh, the case study of Zillow in particular, mm. um, uh, you've, you've, uh, you've really uh, brought that to life, that question of, you know, both grounding uh, an experience of a, of a kind of vital and, and anxiety producing, mm -hmm. um, you know, platform that many of us are familiar with yeah. when we're looking for a place to live or thinking about other people looking mm. for the place where we live, um, and, and and you know both the, the 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 you know sagacity you bring to studying uh, the data and the way they express in the interface on Zillow, but also how that impinged on uh, your your life uh, as you as you moved into Atlanta mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. and became aware of the community. Mm -hmm. So wait, just to summarize, so how how. Does this ethnographic stance, how is it formed by some of these kind of changes? Yeah. Um, so certainly, I, I, I wrote this book in the first person. You know, it's interesting because some early reader responses, you know, the book, the publisher sends out the book for review and they said, you know, this book would sound like a lot more authoritative if you didn't write it in the first person. I said, well, <laughs> that's kind of the whole point of the book. Yeah. 
um, is that I didn't want to take this authoritative stance and, and rather say what my experience was with these data sets and understand that others may have very different experiences. And um, I brought kind of certain tools to the encounters and, and, and others uh, bring their own tools. Um, and certainly, you know, being at MetaLab and being at Harvard gave me access to incredible data sets our data settings, I should say, um, um, that really kind of helped to spark the inquiry. Um, I happened to live very close to the Arnold Arboretum, and I, you know, in, I tried to take my kind of proximity to um, to these settings as um, a reason to kind of to kind of understand them and my relationship with them. And, and uh, I didn't want to study settings that were kind of very remote from me. I think the whole point was not to try to use data as this place, to, as this way to know about something um, at a distance um, and in another um, kind of a place that I had, had no other experiences. And so moving to Atlanta and kind of having to find a place to live, I mean, of course, introduced me to Zillow. Um, it's kind of one of, I think, one of my favorite chapters in the book. I don't, um, I didn't talk about it a lot today because it's, it's quite involved and it takes, a, a, you know, it, explaining it thoroughly is, is not easy. So I encourage you to kind of look at it in the book. But, um, you know, Zillow is this interface, this platform that um, proposes to let you learn about real estate markets across the country without being there. And I was interested in this question of what are the implications for Zillow in Atlanta, where I was, and not thinking about this as a kind of generic interface that um, meant the same thing for every place, but realizing that you know, places had a specificity to them. Um, and you know, Atlanta, uh, which is a minority majority city, um, that is um, facing enormous gentrification now. You know, I landed in the city and somehow I had to kind of contend with what role I was going to play in that. Um, and, um, and, and, and that's how I, how I really um, uh, started to grapple with Zillow. And, uh, and I think it really helped, um, uh, uh, you know, frame my first couple of years in Atlanta in, in really interesting and I think used powerful ways. And, and uh, you know, I got involved with housing justice activists in, in Atlanta because of that. And, and so I think this has been, those kinds of encounters have been kind of uh, really informative to me. And I can see how the Map Room mm -hmm. project in particular yeah. um, helps to, to to make that connection yeah, uh, yeah. happen and make it lively. Yeah. Uh, and I wonder, I mean, it seems like it's a really kind of thick context for engaging in these questions of data and place um, mm -hmm. with folks mm -hmm. and an opportunity to learn how yeah. people contend with data, whether those are civic data or yeah. uh, environmental sensing yeah. data or census data, as you describe, uh, and, and to grapple with uh, how those data are commensurable or incommensurable with their own experience mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. neighborhood, of city, of mm. community. Um, I wonder if you talk a little bit about what you see uh, the impact of that work being. Um, what if the people, map room work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What can people take away? Yeah, yeah. I think from it's a good work? question. You know, I, I was asked by a colleague once. So is the map room an alternative to Zillow? And and <laughs> I, I I I say definitely not. Um, and, but I see it as potentially an antidote. Um, it's a place where we can learn to think critically about data um, by encountering those data in a, in, in a setting that we know well, um, uh, you know, in relationship to a place we know. And so we, you know, Zillow is based on, largely on tax assessment data. Um, you know, I, I interviewed the Fulton County, local Fulton County tax assessor in, it, in Atlanta, and he was quick to tell me um, about how um, error-filled <laughs> that data is, and in part because that data, those tax assessments are, part, are expected to be part of a social process where you're sent the assessment on your property and then you can respond and say, I think this is wrong. And um, um, it's meant to be a kind of 
um, iterative exchange with the county. And data really kind of takes that context away. Um, and, and, you know, for, for Zillow, they don't have to be right. Um, their business model is not based on being right and having um, accurate uh, evaluations. Um, you know, and, and actually they say that their estimates, they call them the Zestimates, are only within 5% of the sale value 50% of the time, which harsh critics have said is close to a coin toss. But, um, <laughs> you know, they're just interested that you keep coming back to the site to check on, oh, how is my property value potentially changing? And, and that, I, I think, feeds a lot of anxiety about the market. And obviously, we're in a situation today where the market is, housing market is out of control. And um, these platforms like this are only exacerbating that. Um, but I, I think the map room, I really see it as, in part, an educational tool. And so we're setting up map rooms in high schools and, and, and hopefully a library nearby. Um, and, and museums and so forth, but also uh, a, a tool that communities can use to advocate for themselves and try to represent their neighborhoods in um, kind of more encompassing ways that maybe all the data available still kind of don't um, 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 deliver. Yeah. Yeah. So one more question about yeah. the local, and then I'll turn yeah. it over to the local uh, yeah. audience. Uh, uh, you you have your list of student. Uh, contributors yeah. and collaborators, yeah. and I wonder if you talk about how students and students mm. at Georgia Tech, in particular, maybe yeah. um, take this paradigm up, uh, because you know I'm thinking, you mm -hmm. know, these are students who are probably thinking very instrumentally, or are encouraged to think very instrumentally about yeah. what data are and can do in the world. Yeah. Um, do, you know, do they? How do they take it up? How do they respond? Yeah, I have to say, you know, it can be very challenging because what I'm proposing um, makes their work more difficult. Um, and I'm asking them to, you know, a, a lot of students who work with technology, um, you know, do so because they don't necessarily think they're, um, that people, that working with people is their forte. Um, and, and it may be an escape for them. Um, but what I insist is that in order to work with data, you have to work with people. And so, as an example, I, um, I often give an assignment where I ask students to go out and interview somebody who is involved in, well, they have to pick a data, um, uh, data collection they're going to work with, and they have to go out and interview someone who is involved in making those data or um, works with them on a regular basis or maybe is a subject of the data, but someone who can kind of add and nuance their understanding of the data set. And they're always resistant. Oh, it's going to be so hard to find someone. How do I find someone? And, and, uh, but they, they always do, and they always come back with their understanding of the data totally transformed, um, which, is, is, um, which, is, which is wonderful. And, uh, and I hope they will continue to do that. Um, but I think it takes, um, uh, it takes a lot of work. And, um, and so, I, and, and I'm sympathetic to students not wanting to do that. And, um, uh, yeah, it's hard for all of us, yeah. Well, now I, I feel inspired to find someone. Okay. So um, what are your questions, your responses, your, your thoughts? Um, uh, when I hand you the mic or, or uh, the, you, the, a microphone makes it to you, it's on, just to let you know. Uh, who'd like to jump in? Vince. Uh, Yanni, thank you for that talk. I think this is fantastic. Uh, and I, I very much appreciate your emphasis on place mm. uh, and on thinking of data settings rather than mm. data sets. Um, as a historian, I work as a historian, and I'm just I'm equally interested in time. Mm. And I wonder if you'd talk a little bit about time and yeah. the accretion and accumulation of data sets. You, you mm. mentioned that you know we should also be asking when yeah. the data sets are yeah. created in what settings. Would you talk a little bit about how you think about you know yeah. the accumulation of meaning yeah. over time when when information gets turned into data? Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, and I should say, uh, Vince Brown's work is in the book, featured in the book also, and uh, I hope you'll check it out, and that will inspire you to go look at his, 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 his larger um, corpus. But um, time, of course, um, you know, and I like to say, no place exists out of time. So it's not as if we can ever look at a, a place um, independently of time. And, and similarly, we can never think about a, a time independently of, of a place in which we're kind of examining it. So I think in a way, you know, those are 
um, we can't disentangle those things. Um, and often what I'll ask students to do is um, when they're working with new data is I'll ask them to investigate or ask someone um, what recent changes have there been to the way that these data are made. And I think that can be incredibly informative. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if you look at, you know, what's happening with the census now, you know, this notion of whether we're going to, you know, have the, the citizen question or not. Um, data are, we, you know, data are always changing. We're always rethinking how we make data. And I think that systems that assume that um, we are going to um, kind of have this kind of fixed or we're just going to find like the best format um, as if it's kind of independent of everything else that might be going on it, it is really wrong. I think, you know, there's a great book called uh, uh, um, Sorting Things Out by Bowker and Starr and they write about data as kind of um, uh, that, that, that data are lively, they're kind of transforming all the time, and we really have to have this kind of facile and light approach to thinking about data. Um, and, and furthermore, you know, data are always historical. Um, we don't like necessarily think about data as historical artifacts, but all data were made in the past. And, um, you know, a lot of the work we're doing now with machine learning, we, requires data to train systems, and then we're surprised when the data have all these artifacts from the past, you know, and in this country we have a long history of sexism and racism that is embedded in those data. So, you know, in a way we can never really be forward looking if we're data driven. So my, my question is very practical, you know, yeah. being, uh, having been you know, recently a user of Zillow, <laughs> <laughs> you know, these platforms exist and they, you know, we use it. Yeah. And, and so how can we then design them in a better way or make something different available? Yeah. Because we, we cannot avoid people using that. They yeah. will and yeah. will more and more need those kind of tools you yeah. know, to, to find a house, to yeah. bring our kids in a certain school. So what what's next? You know, yeah, yeah. how the, can we bring this approach into the design process and redesign platforms and tools in a way that really change the behavior of people? Yeah. That's such an important question. Uh, I think the short answer is uh, I can't, I, I don't know. Um, I don't necessarily see it as my job to completely redefine the way we de design interfaces, but rather I want to present challenges and new models of working with data. Um, you know, this isn't something that I'm going to do on my own. It really relies on people taking risks and experimenting with new ways of relating to data. And, in, you know, instead of having a platform like Zillow, which um, is um, explicitly non-local, um, and tries to give us this kind of this view from a distance. Um, I think we can we can start experimenting with um, with models that have um, that are meant to just deal with a maybe even just one city. What would that look like? How would how would a Cambridge based um, kind of housing uh, application look? Um, but also, I think it, it's a kind of cultural shift, or, you know, that I'm trying to, I want to kind of be part of. That it may be that platforms like Zillow don't go away, but people approach them with more skepticism and more criticality, um, you know, so that they understand that they see a data point and they don't expect that to be a fact. And they actively look for ways to kind of get closer, get you know on the ground, understand you know uh, you know who's who's living in these neighborhoods where I'm looking at houses. How are they going to be affected by my move? I think a lot of people don't realize if they enter a bidding war and they pay a lot more than the asking price for a house, they actually raise the taxes of their neighbors. 
And if your neighbors are fixed or low income, um, that may mean they're displaced. And I think, uh, you know, so I think getting closure means kind of understanding things like that and understanding the implications of your work with data and that a platform like Zillow affects not just users but also non-users. Yeah. A couple of questions over here. Anastasia. Hey, thank you so much. Um, I'm wondering, um, so, so yeah, so you, I think yeah. you, you started talking about uh, essentially my question. Um, uh, even when data are created historically or um, yeah. these platforms are kind of like uh, create their own uh, data sets without any understanding of, of place or yeah. um, time, um, they do end up affecting very like local issues. Mm. Um, I'm specifically thinking about uh, Google Maps examples, yeah. uh, when real uh, real estate developers would uh, decide on their own four-letter acronym for a neighborhood and entirely mm. change like the um, uh -huh. um, the look of it. Yeah. And um, anyway, so I was just wondering if you do any any uh, work on that side of things, uh, take data sets that are essentially fabricated by uh, those in power or the people mm -hmm. behind the platform, and then. Um, and then examine the uh, effects of on on the local populations and um, so there's a good question so I think there's lots of uh, you know if we take a kind of media frame for thinking of data and we say that we can study how data are produced we can do a kind of critical reading of data and we can do a study of how uh, those data are used. Maybe, you know, we, in, folks in media studies might call that like reception studies. Um, my, my book focuses on the first two primarily, trying to understand why do data look a certain way and how do they register um, the, the ways of knowing, the values, the assumptions of the, of the places and the systems in which they're made. And if we, how, how does kind of reading those data closely help to kind of reveal some of that? And, and um, the map room is more of an effort to focus on the third, because I do think by the time I get to the end of the book, you know, you get to the end of these kinds of large projects and you realize you're, you know, what you haven't dealt with. And then that usually becomes your next project. And so the map room is really about understanding what it means for people to, to make use of data um, and in an intimate way, you know, in a social way, in, in conversation with one another and about places that they really care about. And I'm just really getting started on that work uh, to see, you know, how do people put data into context? Um, I really take Borgman's notion that data are rhetorical to heart in studying what people do in the map room. You know, anything can become data in the map room. So, you know, we have a lot of data layers that people can turn on that, you know, are what we might think of as like official or institutional data sets. Um, but sometimes people, you know, reject those or neglect them and instead they um, try to put their lived experiences on the map, and those become data that they or others use to make claims about the places they live. Um, uh, so I think, you know, you point to a really important issue and one that I'm, you know, really just get, getting started with examining, and I think it's, it's, it's incredibly d difficult and, I, and hard to say in a, and I think, you know, it's hard to say in a generalized way how people use data, and I, I'm, an ex, I'm expecting that's going to differ from one place to another, and 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 I'm looking for um, what those differences are kind of attributed to. Yeah. Uh, my question is sort of related to that. Uh, the city of St. Louis has had a big population exodus in the last half century. Mm. Uh, so abandoned properties are a large issue for them. Mm. And the city produced a, a bunch of open data about what they thought was an abandoned property. And the civic data group in the area produced a different yeah. data set. And the city's definition of what was an abandoned property was roughly 
uh, who hadn't paid taxes on a property mm -hmm. in X years. Yeah. And the civic data groups was roughly what buildings don't have roofs, uh, because that's yeah. uh, what most people think of, I think, on the ground. Um, so they kind of engaged in this negotiation mm -hmm. process for how to actually classify yeah. things. I'm wondering if you have any other stories that you think illuminate interesting aspects of that negotiation process mm. when there's yeah. uh, kind of a imposed yeah. meaning for data that doesn't match experience. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's such an interesting example. And I think it points to, again, um, you know, to the frame through which these different groups are seeing those properties. You know, if you're, if you're standing in front of the property, what do you see? Um, if you're looking at, you know, tax records, what do you see? And, and the data are shaped by those, those perspectives, those standpoints. Um, you know, I think one thing that came out, uh, and this is a little different from the example you gave, but uh, uh, one of the contexts we've been using the map room is in Savannah, I mentioned. And um, we did a um, mapping exercise with residents in a neighborhood called Hudson Hill. And, you know, the, the map room, one of the partners in the Savannah project is this uh, climate scientist, Kim Cobb, and her team, of, which includes data scientists and some um, um, local city officials who are trying to build a new network of um, high resolution sea level sensors that are going to help us understand how flooding happens uh, uh, in, in heterogeneous ways across that, that region. And so, you know, we brought that data, you know, we had that data layer, we asked them to make this map, and, you know, their response was, you know, yes, we know that sea level rise is a problem, but we actually have more pressing, what we think of as more pressing problems that we want data on, and they were particularly interested in um, this this one resident said that um, she'll come out into her front yard some days and there'll be white particulate matter all over her car and that she thought that was coming from a, uh, a paper mill nearby and so I said you know draw that how would you draw that on the map and then that led to a discussion about kind of strange smells that people have encountered in this neighborhood and um, and all this led to now this, the sensor project actually adding um, um, air quality sensors, you know, to, to that system. So I think, you know, the map room kind of opened up this conversation. It, that I think what was great about that use of the map room is it wasn't narrowly limited to like these data and, and and interpreting these particular data and 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 the, the place in relationship to them, but rather kind of cast open this this kind of web of possible sources and evidence that could help us understand and think about like what's really important for this neighborhood, and and led to other data collection practices. So, I think that makes me hopeful for the map room as a, as a, as a much more open um, and and grounded way of inter interacting with data. I, um, some of these comments have made me think about the humanity of data mm. and how easy it is to divorce stuff on a, on a screen or stuff on a piece of paper from the humans and the real place and made me think about something that's uh, at least contentious in my life and that's um, a study of a parking garage near my house. Mm. And what they said was, well, first of all, even though the real people who use it say it's full, they said, no, 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 not at all, tons of room. And not only that, they actually made up parking lots in the area, claimed they were real, and said, and besides, they could go to these places that don't exist. Um, and not only that, we can simply manage it. Yeah. We can just tell people they can't go there. Uh -huh. And then there will be room. Yeah. And it's these people sitting there, you know, just massaging numbers. Mm. Yeah. And 
the other thing that someone else brought up about it was, well, did anyone go and see who actually uses the garage now? Mm. Well, you look and right now it's a bunch of beat up cars. And we're planning to put like beamers and stuff mm. like that in there. Yeah. So I, I, it, it really made me think about the, the real dangers of forgetting the humanity of the things that you're looking at. Mm, yeah, yeah. I think that's so important that, you know, we think of data as either something that just exists out there in the world as, I mean, it comes from, you know, the Latin root, it means given, you know, the givens in, in the world. Um, but data are made by people and, um, or, or the machines that they program. To, to collect those data, and they make certain decisions about how they want to, um, you know, what counts as data and what doesn't, and what the shape of those data are. And uh, another exercise I give my students often is to go out and collect their own data, and it's incredibly frustrating for them because they <laughs> they realize all these decisions they have to make about, oh well, you know, what's going to be in the data set, what's not going to be, you know. A lot of students want to take, you know, make a, you know, use photography as part of their data making process, and then they have to, you know, well, how far away from the subject am I going to be, and what angle am I going to be at, and all these things. And I think they come away with this much, this sense of the humanness of data, as you say, um, and and it, and it, it's an important lesson. Yeah. So thanks for that. Thank you all for those questions. And, and Yanni, thank you so much for being here with us and, and talking about your book and your practice. And, and uh, I want to remind everyone that the book is available for sale. I uh, couldn't recommend it highly enough. Take it, use it, um, share it. Thank you, Yanni. Let me know what you think. Yeah, thanks.